Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. I'm going to talk about rapid climate change and the impacts on environmental assessment. Mostly I'll be discussing rapid climate change. 2016 is an incredibly exceptional year in terms of the rapidity of the changes that we're seeing to global climate. We're seeing temperature spiraling upwards. We're seeing sea ice reaching almost a minimum, a record minimum, and then not growing properly. We're seeing extreme weather events uh, around the world with more frequency, severity, and duration. We're seeing basically climate mayhem, extremely highly nonlinear effects in the climate system, huge disruptions, not just in the climate system, we're also seeing this in political systems, uh, notably uh, in the last few weeks in the US elections. So let me get on to explaining to you exactly how our climate is changing and why these changes are extremely, or should be extremely concerning to all humanity that lives on this planet. Okay, I just got the light. So in terms of environmental assessments, whenever we do a project, we traditionally and historically do an environmental assessment to look at local and regional direct effects of a project on the environment during the construction and perhaps short-term time periods. To account for climate change, environmental assessments need to consider the effect of the project in the near and long terms on the overall global climate system. Basically, this does not occur at the moment. Climate change is not even considered in the way we do environmental assessments that will only look at the local, not the, not the, 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 long, the, the, uh, the greenhouse gas component. So in order to modify these EAs to make them relevant in today's world of rapidly changing climate, we need to examine the greenhouse gas emissions for the construction process. We need to examine the greenhouse gas emissions for the operation of the project over its expected lifetime. And we also need to look at indirect greenhouse gas emissions. For example, during the operation of the project compared to no project existing. For example, downstream emissions of the product being carried, like with the pipeline project, if the oil would not be flowing without that pipeline to the market, then the oil coming out the end of the pipeline is then burned, combusted, producing greenhouse gases. Those need to be considered if they're new emissions, if this project expands on it. Of course, we don't want to double count greenhouse gases. So if we consider them just at the mine source, um, then we don't want that, that will help us not miss any emissions. This is very important to do. And Climate change is basically ignored in environmental assessments, whether they be in, in uh, Canada or the US primarily. I'm not too sure about European ones. So the particular, I'll give an example of a region where I'm looking at environmental assessments. And this is Manitoba in Canada. And uh, this is showing where different, um, this is First Nations communities and tribal councils in Manitoba, all of these different dots. Um, so Aboriginal peoples. This is different communities, for example, Ojibwe, Ojibwe Cree, uh, Denny, um, and Cree and Dakota communities. So there's all these different communities. They obviously need to have a strong say in what is happening um, in their regions. But an environmental assessment could be applied to any region. So this is a good example. So this is the climate system of the Earth. Um, let's talk about human time scales. So we have basically the sky, we have the water, we have the land, we have the ice, the snow and ice, we have the plants and animals. So we have all of these different components and they all interact. So in the atmosphere, we have the core components, nitrogen, oxygen, argon. Then we have the, the uh, greenhouse gases, water vapor, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, ozone also. Then we have the aerosols, 
which can block sunlight cause, and, and, uh, and uh, cause global, a phenomenon called global dimming and offset some of the warming of the planet from the greenhouse gases. There's lots of exchange between the different systems. As we heat up the earth, as we heat up the atmosphere and the oceans, then there's more evaporation. Therefore, there's more water vapor going up into the atmosphere. In fact, for every degree Celsius warming of global average temperature warming, there's about 7% more water vapor in the atmosphere, and that's also a strong greenhouse gas. So that's a very strong feedback. Work we, whatever we do on the surface of the planet changes the, if we change the balance of carbon, if we put more carbon into the atmosphere ocean system, then we generate the warming. This is the anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gas warming. We are changing the nature of the soils and how much carbon they absorb. We're cutting down forests and putting agriculture. That's, we're changing the carbon sinks. We're changing as we grow food. We're also changing the reflectivity of the surfaces, which, is, which affects how much light gets reflected and absorbed. So we're making all of these changes and these have happened in a haphazard fashion and we have to be a lot smarter. Of course, the sun is driving all of these processes. So if you change one thing, you change lots of other things. We have to understand this from a systems point of view, a top level systems point of view. It's okay to specialize on individual sections, which is what the scientific community is very good at. What the scientific community is not great at is putting all of the pieces together. We need more of this systems type thinking to address our problems with climate change. So basically, I look at the global overall climate system and I try to join the dots. So increased human fossil fuel combustion and land use changes is occurring on a large scale, has been since uh, the Industrial Revolution. There's been a, there's a lot more people on the planet and our technology has improved or has become more sophisticated. So we can have a much larger influence on the planet as time goes on, and we have. So atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, are quickly increasing at ever increasing rates. So this is exponential growth. The earth warms. We get a rapid decline in the Arctic sea ice and snow cover that melts. We get more melting on Greenland. So the Arctic is darker, all these surfaces are darker. The ice is and snow is replaced by open seawater in the case of sea ice. So therefore, because surfaces are darker, there's more sunlight absorbed. So the north is warming faster by at least five to eight times the global average. If you look up in the high Arctic, it's warming. It's incredibly warm. In fact, uh, you know, here we are in mid-November and the temperature at the North Pole is around zero. The higher, the farther north you go, the more warming you get. So in the region we're looking at in particular, Manitoba, you go to northern Manitoba, there's a lot more warming than southern Manitoba. You go further away from water bodies, there's a lot more warming. You have a continental effect versus a moderation effect if you live near a water body. So all of this warming in the north, much faster than the global average, it decreases the equator to Arctic temperature difference. There's less heat, therefore, moving from the equator to the pole. The amount of heat transfer, heat always moves from hot areas to cold areas. The amount of heat that moves uh, is larger if the temperature difference is larger. So because this temperature difference is decreasing, there's a lot less heat moving from the equator to the pole. How does the heat move in the first place? About two-thirds moves in the atmosphere, one-third in the oceans. In the atmosphere, it, it, uh, these wind movements get concentrated at high altitudes where jets fly and we get these jet streams. That forms the jet streams, this temperature difference. So as the temperature difference declines, the jet streams slow down, become wavier and often stuck in position. When they get stuck in position, then we get these torrential rain events. The extreme weather events are more frequent, stronger, and they last longer. They're also happening in places where they would not normally happen. In the oceans, the slowdown of the heat transfer slows down currents like the Gulf Stream slows down. 
and uh, then the water gets pushed up over the continental shelf and we get large sea level rise, for example, on the eastern coast of the US compared to um, other, other coastlines. So all of these things are, are happening very, very quickly. So let's look at some of the details. So this is a, an image using Climate Reanalyzer, a very good University of Maine tool. Just Google Climate Reanalyzer, have a look at the daily weather map, and you can get all of these parameters. You can look at temperatures, anomalies, sea surface temperatures, clouds, all kinds of parameters, the jet streams. So this is a temperature anomaly. What does that mean? It's the temperature on Monday, November 14th, the difference, you take that temperature, you subtract it from the average um, at a given location uh, with a baseline of 1979 to 2000. So if you take the average at a location between these years, take uh, mon this Monday just past temperature, subtract them, this is the difference. So look at all the warmth over North America, but look at the red 20 degrees Celsius or 36 degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than normal, all over the Arctic Ocean here, all over northern Canada up here, um, into Alaska. It's just phenomenally warm weather. Meanwhile, the warm, the cold in the Arctic has shifted, not over North America. We'd hear all the meteorologists complaining, oh, the polar vortex is back, without talking about climate change. It's crazy. Climate change is, is the root cause of all of this disruption. The cold air has gone to the Siberian side, record cold temperatures there, but there's not much of it. The cold, so the Arctic, so the, the Arctic, the pole, if you like, has shifted to Siberia if you look at it on a temperature basis. Have a look yourself. Now the Arctic is almost five degrees Celsius warmer than normal. Um, Check, uh, in, in a few days, this number is gonna be seven or seven and a half degrees, which is unheard of. The climate system is broken. The Arctic temperatures are broken and the entire world will suffer the consequences because what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. It's not like uh, Las Vegas. Okay, so let's, ha let's move forward. So what do we have here? This is just another view of the same thing. So look at these huge Arctic uh, temperatures, 20 or 36 degrees warmer than normal. This is the only cold area and you get heat spots over all of the continents. Also much of Antarctica is warm and Australia is kind of bi temperature, bipolar in terms of temperature. You know, extra warm here, colder here and so on. There's not many cold areas on the planet here. Okay, we can also, using the same tool, Climate Reanalyze, Reanalyzer, we're looking at the uh, sea surface temperature. So what you can see is the water is extremely warm, again, up in the Arctic, which is stopping the sea ice from expanding. As the sea ice is growing, the extent tries to grow, it pushes into warm water and it gets quickly melted out. I'll talk more about that in a minute. You can see the warm area of the Gulf Stream pushing through and there's cold water coming down from very fast melt from Greenland. So the warm water is, is sort of descending underneath it and then coming up and poking through. So you get a very, uh, very granular structure here. Also, we have cold water pool here and we have the very warm water, record warm water is going up through the Bering Strait to, to the ice. There's also other structure here we had a uh, very strong El Nino, which has then turned into a weak La Nina, or almost a La Nothing uh, here. Um, but it's amazing because global temperatures haven't responded in kind. So Earth Null School, Google this. It's a very, it gives you a global map of weather and ocean conditions. You click on Earth in the bottom left and you get the menus and you can look at whatever you want and in this case it suggests stream behavior very convoluted lots of ripples and loops and things very unusual behavior so i'm going to stop here this is part one and uh please uh go to part two uh to to uh cont i'll continue with part two thank you